CaseWorks in Grid 110, and he's a faculty member at Cal State Los Angeles. His work revolves around the intersection of media, education, and technology. And he too has won awards for his entrepreneurship and scholarship from the Wharton School of Business, McGraw-Hill, Milken Foundation, and others. So we have quite a panel today, and I'd like to ask Justin to please start us off with some information about pedagogical approaches as we fold in, techno as we fold in technology and entrepreneurship education. So Justin, it's all you. Hi everybody, I'm gonna share my screen, so just give me about five seconds to get this up and ready to go. Uh, let's see here, so I'll turn this into uh, full screen mode. So, um, Definitely going to talk uh, about our platform, CaseWorks, but I'll just give you a little bit of background. I'll go really fast because we've got a lot of people, uh, but I will put all of these resources uh, in, in, uh, in Whova as well as here so you can uh, access them. Uh, so by trade, I'm a film producer. I actually teach at the film school at Cal State LA, uh, but I did co-found uh, CaseWorks, uh, which we'll be talking about as well as Grid 110, which is a nonprofit tech accelerator in downtown Los Angeles. So I wanted to start off with a discussion about two areas of pedagogical approach that we might be looking at at this time so that we can bring uh, experiential education and keep it in the teaching of entrepreneurship, which can be really difficult now that we have all these obstacles. We're gonna look at two main areas. One is the area of storytelling and the other one is the area of stress, specifically stress inoculation. Um, so everything I do is really built around storytelling from a teaching perspective. And there's two main reasons why uh, I do that. The first is that the brain as an organ is an emotional organ before it is a logical organ. Uh, it, logic came much later in the evolutionary chain for our brains. And so what we do is we, we build emotions and dispositions against uh, something out in the world and then we use logic to sort of back up our actions. So understanding that the brain is an emotional tool is really important in understanding how storytelling is a way to unlock uh, the brain for deeper understanding. The second element is as a, a species, we really don't have a better uh, container for experience or a way to pass experience across other people than storytelling. When you look at advanced learning, we move away from rote memorization, we move away from formulas, and we start moving into stories, parables, uh, fables, this way of containing uh, an experience and being able to pass down the lessons. So those are the two elements about story that are really, really important moving forward. The second uh, area that we're gonna focus on is stress inoculation. Uh, some of you might be familiar with it. It is a cognitive, cognitive behavioral therapy, a CBT. Uh, it's used widely in a lot of different afflictions from PTSD to substance addiction, uh, substance addiction uh, relationship issues. And SIT, stress inoculation therapy, is really about raising the floor in people, um, helping them find less things stressful over time as opposed to making them learn with stress or making them cope with stress. Um, one thing to understand about young people, if you look at them over the past century, not just the past few decades, but the past century, they have increasingly had high stress levels. It's always been trending up for over a century. In the past two decades, it's gotten really, really uh, toxic, really, really pointed. We're seeing young adults do things that we would characterize as delaying adulthood. They're getting married later. They're having kids later, staying in the home later, starting businesses later. All these things are getting pushed off, and when you drill down into it, a lot of it has to do with the fact that they are feeling incredibly high levels of stress, and this new pandemic that we're dealing with is only going to kick that up even, even further. So what we're trying to do is inoculate them against stress as opposed to insulate them from stress. We're trying to raise the floor and create a scaffolded, safe place where they can experience things that they would find stressful, but over time, find them less stressful. So using those two elements together, that's really been our uh, MO when building CaseWorks. Now CaseWorks is a platform. We do a lot of different curricula. Entrepreneurship was our first one, but we, did, we have curricula in uh, unconscious bias, difficult conversations in the workplace, 21st century skills. All these things are hard to master skills that will, that will require confronting stressful situations. So the first curriculum that we built uh, which is uh, called Street Fighting Entrepreneurship. It's used in about 25 uh, institutions around the country and, and actually around the world. Um, and what we did is we tried to create a series of stories. They play like short films. Uh, they're very high level uh, production value. Uh, and what we're trying to do is get people emotionally engaged. The platform itself is uh, designed to 
place people in emotional situations and then have them make decisions. That's the whole point of the platform. So once you watch these scenarios, you're driven toward, toward a decision pathway and you actually make decisions in the scenario. It's a choose your own ending type of experience. And we use that mechanism as a way to learn. When they're making these emotional decisions, we go back and we try to figure out why did you make that decision? How might we build skills to help you make better decisions going forward? So that's the core element of it. The platform has a lot of bells and whistles from, you know, an embeddable timeline to uh, chat areas and areas for asynchronous collaboration among cohorts. Uh, the production value is very high. So there's a lot of bells and whistles, but the main element is placing people in emotional situations that they might find stressful or triggering giving them the opportunity to interact with decision-making and then going back and learning through that experience. Um, so we use that on CaseWorks, but the two main elements of storytelling and stress inoculation, pretty much anybody can do. We don't have time to go through all these tips. I'll put some, uh, some resources in, in the uh, chat area and as well as Uva. But on the storytelling side, one of the main things that you can remember is the more you understand about story structure, which is a millennia old craft, the better you get at that, the better you're gonna be able to introduce it into your classroom and become a better educator. You can literally 10X your teaching efficacy by becoming a better storyteller. On the stress inoculation side, clarity is really the key. Uh, clear learning objectives, clear communication pathways, clear expectations, and building ideas of nutritional conflict, which is the idea that conflict is not bad in and of itself. There is a lot of areas of conflict that we can isolate and scaffold so that we can learn more and really build those hard to master skills. So happy to talk on a deeper level uh, for anybody who's hearing this, my email is below. You can also reach me at Whova and I'll put a number of these resources in various places so that you can find them. Uh, but thanks a lot for, uh, for joining us and uh, I look forward to uh, hearing the next presentations. Thanks so much. Justin, thank you very much. Christoph, to you to podcasts. Okay, thank you. Um... And thanks, Justice, uh, Justin and, and Julie for, for kicking us off. Um, I'm going to uh, share my screen in a second. Uh, we'll do this twice today. Okay. So what I will be talking about today is uh, how I've been using a podcast um, in the classroom, which I initially used in a way to bring in some additional content and then have a conversation about these stories. Again, building off what, what Justin just said in terms of the storytelling element, um, really learning from uh, other people's stories, uh, something that I find particularly interesting as relates to some of my uh, work, uh, initial work as an educational psychologist around self-regulation and really uh, social cognition in particular, as we think about modeling, in particular cognitive modeling as a way to get a better understanding how people think, how to reflect about different kinds of elements and using this as a way to build our own self-efficacy uh, on the one hand, but also use as a way to, you know, have a, a better way to prepare ourselves as we then take deliberate uh, steps towards uh, entrepreneurial action in our case. Um, the problem statement that I started out with uh, when I designed this particular exercise for my classroom, and I used this in particular for a graduate classroom in uh, a graduate class in, in business modeling, but this can also be applied to many other um, types of uh, similar classes, uh, is really to leverage the power of storytelling for learning. Again, building what, what Justin just said. Um, but also, you know, having this issue often that we cannot often bring those high quality guest speakers into our class, right? You know, we at Iona College, we have some great alumni uh, that we could bring into campus, but you know, these are also very busy people. So is it, is it often feasible and possible to bring in uh, people on campus, but also scaling this in a way and replicating the way to really uh, use it as, as instructional tools. So I, I felt this was often uh, frustrating uh, that we often don't get the guest speakers that we need at the time that we, that we want them. Um, and also to learn from these stories, really the good, the bad, and the ugly. There's, I think, a lot of emphasis still on the success stories, particularly as we talk to students that often idolize particular entrepreneurs and often forget about the story behind it, uh, the, the journey that people undertook, the failures that they, that they encountered, and often uh, sort of these, these breaking points that they encountered as a result of these experiences. And um, last but not least, also to demystify some of these successful entrepreneurs, that they are humans and not gods. And I think that's something that I try to really counter a lot of times, uh, often mostly with the undergraduate students, but also often at the graduate level. So I created this assignment, essentially I'm using, and I'm 
this is the assignment as I posted on, on the syllabus. But essentially what it does, is it's, it's a podcasting assignment where the students have to listen to uh, the podcast from NPR's How I Built This by Guy Ross. Uh, and students in smaller teams individually have to, you know, listen to those podcasts, have to then create a, a visual story or a visual storyboard of that story. They then bring into the class, present that story, tell that story. And then as a team, as a group, as an entire class, we then develop uh, together uh, how the value proposition for the business that the, or the businesses that these entrepreneurs have worked on have evolved and ultimately also building out a business model as a result of that. Um, the last part I usually did in the classroom by using like a, you know, a, a large scale, a business model canvas uh, on our, uh, on, on a whiteboard. Uh, but as we also move into an online environment, I will also show how I've been using this by using uh, an online tool, uh, the, uh, the Canvanizer, which some of you may have used. Uh, an important element here is also uh, the reflection piece, like what do these stories tell us? What are the lessons learned? How can I apply them to my business ideas uh, as I then you know, venture out and try to, to gain some traction there? Uh, these are some of the design elements uh, for the assignment. You know, these are, these are again summarized here with the podcast, we have the visual storytelling element, the business modeling, and then the self-reflection uh, and action piece. Uh, podcasts are external. I can bring them and then source them from any types of podcasts. I'm using the NPR podcast. Storytelling happens at the individual level or at the group level. The business modeling exercise is a collaborative exercise within the class. And then the reflection is something that we do as a class, but often also I prompt the students to then go back and really think about the lessons learned and how we can apply them. Okay, so this is how the class typically flows. Every beginning of the class, I either have a podcast that we will discuss, uh, or uh, I bring in a guest speaker. In this case, I only focus on the podcast. Um, and it was kind of interesting this year because uh, we were at the USASB conference and they still had class and I didn't want to cancel class, I actually got a Zoom class. And so whatever you see right now is the product of the Zoom class from, from earlier this year. Uh, in this particular case, uh, um, two students were asked to you know, review and, and, and uh, more closely examine uh, the, the podcast of Canva or the story of Canva, particularly Melanie Perkins. Um, so, you know, the students listened to the podcast and then created the digital story, which I'll share in a second now. So the students then created this, and this is sort of a collection of the screenshots, you know, surprisingly, or not surprisingly, the students actually used Canva to create that visual story, which is pretty cool. Uh, and again, in very targeted uh, ways, really tell that story about, you know, from publishing, sort of how the issue, uh, how the issue has evolved in terms of, you know, the, the issue of home publishing, um, and how uh, Melanie then and her team then gradually developed Canva and, and, and the, the various steps involved. Once the students came back and presented these ideas to the class, and on the left, you see a class, how I did this uh, in person. And on the right, uh, I will show now how I've uh, done this particular uh, example in an online environment. I'm gonna switch screens again. So I'll show you now um, how the students uh, in that Zoom session have used the Canvanizer tool to co collaborate on uh, the development of this particular, um, of this particular uh, business model. So as you will see, we started off with, you know, I assigned students to particular um, um, components of, of the business model canvas by name, and then I asked them individually to then reflect and go into that, um, uh, into that particular subject matter. So I'm gonna fast forward now. So as you see, gradually the business model uh, evolved, uh, students made their contributions, uh, as, as we did this synchronously. Um, and the business model sort of took shape, right? The story of Canva came to life in terms of the business model canvas. And once we sort of came to the conclusion, we then um, you know, discussed the different elements. We dug a little bit deeper, we reflected about this and also applied the lessons to, um, to the work that we did uh, actually inside the classroom. Just wanted to show you how this was a dynamic process. This wasn't just somebody submitting something for the sake of submitting something. Um, Wonderful. And I'm just at one more slide. 
Sure. Um, the last piece, the reflective piece is important. Uh, you know, I usually do this inside the classroom, so I didn't have that much evidence here, but I looked in some of the reflective statements that the students have, have put together. In this case, a student said, like, you know, the podcasts and the speakers in the class were extremely helpful in building my creative confidence. And again, giving the students sort of this, 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 this gateway into somebody's thinking, uh, how do you reflect it about their own work, but now applying these to their own to their own lives is something I think that was very transformative as it relates to this particular exercise. All right, that's all that I have to say at this point in terms of an input. Uh, I also make the slides available online as well as some additional resources. Again, thanks for the opportunity and I look forward to continue the conversation. This is great. Thank you, Christoph, very much. Ernie, would you like to show us what you're, you've been up to with Marketplace? Yes, I 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 this is like 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 this is like
a uh, carbon fiber bike. So the, the assignment is to test market this business concept in three segments, the recreation, mountain, and speed, and in four test markets, uh, New York, Rio, Amsterdam, and Bangalore. Now, what I did was I recruited people from around the world that I work with. Uh, there's Mary Hannah Flesh in, in the United States, Paul Choi in South Korea, Bindu Agawal in India, and Reno Sr. in the Dominican Republic. And uh, what I've done is captured the first few minutes of their uh, getting started. And I'm gonna play that so you can see how this actually works. Ernie, I'm not sure that we can hear the video. What's that? I'm not sure that we can hear the video. Do you want me to try to run it on this side? I'm sorry, Julie, I couldn't hear you. We can't hear the, at least I cannot hear the video. Can anybody else hear the video? Okay. Okay. Let me Let's try again. Actually, Ernie, let's let me see if I can run it on this side. Um, okay. Let me see if I can. Sh too many things here. Let me see if I can. I don't think the videos work well with Zoom, so we might have to forego it. Maybe we could. Um, we can certainly post it on the Whova. Yeah, we can send the link out and put it in the chat and then uh, keep it going. Okay. Okay. All right. So what I wanted, what I was trying to do, and, and I'll kind of talk it through. If you can't hear it, I'm going to just let it progress. And um, what I have is a one of the uh, participants is explaining the logic of choosing the market uh, that they'll be targeting. And, and so he is moving through. Okay. So Ernie, I think one of the things that would be good, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting to see how it's moving through, but I think one of the big things that you, you wanted to bring out with this was that it's, uh, there's teammates are used to working on this uh, remotely anyway. So it's a good way to, to incorporate the fact that now that, now that people can't be in the same room, it's very easy to, to utilize a, a simulation like this because it's, it's, it's been done and it's been tested and tried for years, right? Yeah, and, and if you can, can you see my last slide? Yes, the one that says you can do this? Yes. Yeah, okay, that was what I wanted to demonstrate is that here we had four people from all over the world who are working together dynamically and each one of them has control of uh, the software and they can uh, move around independently uh, of the other members of the team but if they share the screen they can get everybody to focus in on something in particular such as the market research uh, to determine a, a segment or trying to figure out which city to start with uh, test marketing uh, coming up with a company name and so forth and so everybody is um, 
has access to everything simultaneously. And so it's kind of like the hub that everything revolves around. And then if you use video conferencing like Zoom, normally a little better than what we see here, uh, or video chat, or even a phone call, a conference call, they can all collaborate. And one of the things which you see is that the students have a lot of experience and, and even you as faculty member do too. Um, and it's really quite natural. In fact, in, in my business, I work with uh, uh, product developers, uh, designers, support people, customers all over the world, just like what we're doing here. And this is the norm. And we can take advantage of that in learning um, in an online environment. So that was Good. the message that I wanted to give you. Wonderful, Ernie. And and de definitely do share not just the, the short video clip, but I think that you had said you even had a longer video clip that kind of demonstrated this in, in detail. So make sure that we get that in the Whova app so that people can, can reference it. Okay, okay, Elisa, you're up. Make sure we unmute you. Tam, are you able to help unmute Elisa? Yeah, I'm trying to. Oh, there, oh, she, there, is. there, she, there she goes. Uh, yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to try to share uh, my try to share my uh, screen, but I've had, as, as they all knew beforehand, some serious problems with my internet connectivity. So I may need someone else to step in. So let's try this. Okay. Can people see that? Yes? Okay, I'm going to need somebody else to pull this up then. I'm going to stop sharing and I ask somebody to pull up the the cover of mine because it's an internet connectivity issue um, and hopefully people can do that as I speak. I want to make sure there's time for Q&A so I'm going to dive right in and I'm, you'll put up a, a DIY cover and I'll tell you when to advance uh, the screen once I start seeing the slides. Okay. So I believe uh, that the genesis right of really, hello? Hi, did you see it? Do you see it right now, Alyssa? It I don't. Up. I see that you're sharing the screen, but I haven't yet seen the picture. So I'm just going to guess where it is. That it's on a cover that shows my name. Okay. So but. I'll just tell you when to advance, and we'll just hope it works. Um, so I, yeah, there we go. But I want that's not the first page. You want to go back, back to the first page, please. Um, it's a cover that shows DIY. So hopefully, we'll go back and. Um, you're good. You're okay. Back. One more to the, to the front. But anyway, what I was going to say was that I think the genesis of this conference being online is actually largely the genesis of this particular session of the conference as well. Uh, the fact that we, of course, can't be together and the consequence is that we must use technology mediated options to connect with each other, to connect with our students, uh, to connect with our colleagues. Um, and I think that what we've heard so far is that the common link here isn't just that, but this notion of technology and all of the technologies that I have seen so far are technologies that would work well both on campus and off campus. These are technologies that can enhance your regular on campus classroom um, and make um, your classroom more engaging and more efficient. There are things that you can do using these technologies that if you were to do them without the technologies in class would slow things down. And yet at the same time, these are things that you can pull off online 100%, as Ernie just showed, and, and students can function very well, very effectively, and they don't even actually need the physical classroom at all. Um, what my interest has been for a long time, and frankly, I thought it was chasing a little bit of a fool's errand, it was just a hobby, was trying to figure out how can I actually build my own things. And so what I'm trying to bring to this conversation, or what I was asked to bring to this conversation was, a little bit of that, and anybody who knows me has heard some version of this, but I'm going to do a little bit differently today. And that was this notion of what can you do yourself if, if you can't purchase things or don't want to, though the purchasable things. Mm -hmm. I've seen Ernie's Marketplace Simulation demoed multiple times over the years. It's extraordinary. And similarly, what Justin and Jason, his partner, have been building in casework is, works is fantastic. I'm totally going to steal Christoph's idea for my classes when I go back to teaching. 
um, they're giving me a, a momentary breather. So I learned how to be the director of the center. But what I thought I would focus on is, is more of what I do. And there's a few things that I start out with, which is just, if you want to create your own thing, there's a few, I think, rules of the road uh, that I would propose. And that's on the next slide. And these are rules that have always been true to me um, as I've tried to build things and as I've worked with others to build things. I don't see the slide, but hopefully you see a person breaking the rules by standing on the grass. And what the slide would say um, is that my personal rule of the do-it-yourself road for trying to create technology interventions is that there's very easy installation, very reliable installation, or that it could be on the cloud, so there's zero installation, that it's very intuitive. You can figure out how to use it almost immediately, that you can scale it from 10 students to 1,000 students without even practically blinking an eye, and in my ideal world, not just because I'm miserly, it's free or cheap because there's just a lot of schools out there and a lot of students, the schools, the faculty, the staff and the students might not have access. And this way you get universal access, of course, with the biggest being you still have to have the technology and the computer connection, which also obviously does exclude people. So I thought I'd give you a walk through something that we've built in the last two weeks, which has been exhausting but also exhilarating. <laughs> we still don't know how it's gonna turn out. And that's what we've been calling the Hack for Hope at USC, which is on the next slide. You'll see the homepage of it. And um, what had happened was a lot of people in our university were running around trying to figure out what could be done to help. And for some reason, I decided, and I have not yet decided whether this is a silly decision, a foolish decision, or a good decision, that we should build an online hackathon, even though we'd never done that before and that we would try to build it very, very quickly and try to launch it and run it. This was the website that we set up on Squarespace. Somebody who was attached tweeted that we'd launched it before we'd actually made it public. And our crosstown rival, UCLA, promptly tweeted back that while they're usually rivals, they liked what we were doing. And on that basis, I gave them a call, um, Elaine Hagan over at UCLA, and say, well, rather than just like what we're doing, how about you join us? And it became the USC UCLA Rivals Unite Hack for Hope. We launched it just 10 days ago. It's a, it, it, the, the submissions are gonna be due in two days. And what you see is the front end web screen, very inexpensive through Squarespace, set up in just four hours. If you go to the next page, um, you can see we had all of the communication go through students with um, signing up in what's called Discord, which is used by many gamers, but it's much like Slack. A tremendous number of people can sign up, it's free, and they can begin to communicate. I'll just call attention to a few different pieces of this. Um, if you click once, Tam, you should open up a red circle around the left bar, or square, rather, rectangle. What you see there are all of the individual teams. So they each have their own channel in which to communicate asynchronously and rapidly through instant messaging. If you click again, you'll see on the right hand side that you also have the ability as people come in to label their skill sets. So we had to figure out how to connect teammates and this was one of the ways we did it. If you click again, you'll see that it has functionality where some of the names are actually in this picture, all of the names are green. This is because we had legal disclaimers that people needed to read and acknowledge and the system is smart enough that when people would do something inside of Discord, it changed their name to green. So just by glancing at the names, we would know who saw and who didn't see uh, the legal disclaimer. And finally, in the middle section, you have the ability, much like Slack, to post and embed all sorts of content that you find if you click again. And helping us navigate this in the background is a real-time dashboard, if you click again, that shows us how many people are in the system. I created the slides this morning. In fact, this morning we had about 450 people in there. So it's been a little bit crazy. I'm oh, sorry, that wasn't a laugh because it was fun and funny. It was a laugh like I'm ready to go into an insane asylum. It was a little bit crazy to do this, but it is what it is. And you can also see how people code themselves. If you go to the next slide. You can see there's also a place called DevPost, which exists, which you can sign up on for free, where people can submit their projects. If you advance to the next slide. Well, I don't actually, okay. What you can see is uh, that by using free or almost free tools, you can assemble some remarkable things pretty quickly. I don't know if the output is gonna be remarkable, but I certainly think the effort has been remarkable. The team of about six of us have put this together. We used Squarespace for the website, DevPost as a project receptacle, Discord for communication, 
We had signups and forms. We used Google Drive. Of course, Zoom for meetings where we brought in guest speakers and mentors. And then the final project will be uploaded to Vimeo. And by doing this, we have people participating from all over the world. And the total price tag has been for us about $200. And um, it's just an example, I think, of how these various individual tools can be put together to build really a tremendous number of things. If you're talking about video cases and, and you can't afford caseworks or it's not something that you choose, you can do selfie videos where people fill themselves. Uh, your students can record their own podcast. I don't think anybody can build a simulation. I think you got to go to Ernie for that one. That's pretty extraordinary. But that was just another thing I wanted to throw out there. And I don't know what the next slide says. You'll have to remind me. That's all. I think that um, in this time of uncertainty, we teach about how to cope and navigate and walk with the walk at times of dynamism uncertainty. And so all of these tools allow us to do that. And I don't think there's that much harm in rolling the dice a little bit right now and allowing our students to go along the ride, along on the ride and seeing us try to walk our talk. And on that note, I'll stop talking. Absolutely. Thank you. Impressive. All, all impressive things. So here's a question uh, that I've got for you guys. And that is, well, it's actually kind of a twofold question. One, what, what do you envision is the role of the instructor during this time of complete, uh, in many cases, complete change of uh, mode of delivery? And two, what are some like two or three simple things that instructors can do to translate what they're currently doing and moving it onto uh, some kind of an online platform? So what is that I'll, rule? I'll jump in and uh, anybody else can join me. Uh, I view the instructor in a different role, much more of a coach, all right? Uh, if you think about instructor and teacher, it's giving information. And I like to view uh, the professor as a coach where the students are really engaged in something that's challenging, that's requiring that they apply the knowledge that they have been uh, gaining um, and working to develop skills. And what you have is a coach who can challenge them even more to identify things that maybe they're overlooking, they're not thinking about, that maybe their horizon's not large enough. Um, and sometimes even to give a little bit of a chalk talk on things that are clear that they are missing. So they get information uh, and, and uh, principles and insight at a point in time when it's most relevant to them because they're facing something that's challenging them and, or they're overlooking. And, and you'll see that they pay attention so much more because you're helping them move their business forward. So I like the role of a coach, all right? Good. In, Interesting. And I think it works in these other cases as well. So anybody else different, different uh, kind of archetype than a coach uh, in this? Yeah, Justin, Justin and then Elisa. Okay, then I'll go last. Yeah. So I would, um, the, the two main things I would say, it, it, the, the less physicality you have, the less real world uh, ability to be in physical proximity, the more tangibility you have to bring. So um, that means more real world cases, focusing on their ventures, uh, things that are really going to lock them in, in an immersive or paying attention type state. The more theoretical you get, if you stay theoretical in these environments, it becomes very isolating and becomes very distancing from a, from an intellectual perspective. So any attempts you can bring to bring to to, to introduce more tangibility uh, from real world examples, speakers, I think all of that's going to help. Um, from a educator perspective, my advice is find the tools you're going to use and then become experts in them. There's nothing worse than stumbling through tech issues and not knowing how to use a particular platform, whether it's Zoom, whether it's our platform, whether it's another platform, it really throws people out um, and it's hard to get them back after. So I would say those two things come forefront to mind. Excellent, thank you. Lisa. Um, I think I would uh, say that, sorry, <coughs> um, excuse me, um, I agree with everything that's been said previously, but I think I would add that college is so much more than the classroom and so what our students are losing right now isn't just the classroom environment and the content, it's that it's the community, it's the togetherness, it's the moral support, it's the friendships. And 
because they're probably primarily coming together now inside of the online classroom, I think it adds an additional challenge for the faculty member, uh, which is a good challenge, but, but definitely a challenge, which is to serve as a role model of hopefully what graceful um, leadership is by helping them connect, by being calm. In some ways, though, I don't want to overstate it, almost being not a therapist, but um, a, a supporting mechanism that allows them to understand that the stress they're feeling uh, is okay, is normal, is universal, and that you as their instructor have the tools to help them, at least in this environment. And so I think that it's really an opportunity for all of us as instructors to role model humanity. I know that sounds a little bit too grandiose, perhaps, but I feel very strongly about it, that in some ways that reminder of all of our sort of shared, shared frailty, all the shared challenges that people are facing, that that's what's going to be that extra thing beyond the classroom that people will remember beyond this. Yeah. Uh, can I add to this? Because I, I really I really like how the, the response has built up from like the coaching mentality to, you know, really sort of trying to, you know, understand the tools to you know understanding the humanity of what it actually means to have a classroom however we define it and and i've said this you know through numerous uh, occasions particularly as we prepared our faculty at the college for online education but you know essentially we're instructional designers right we have to create a new learning environment and as a result you know when we design something i felt that the design thinking process in itself is very uh critical as a, as, a, as a tool, as a methodology for us to, to engage in that, in that journey. So empathy building is, is core and center, uh, pretty much echoing what Elisa just said. If I do not understand who my students are that I'm trying to serve, and in relation to the learning objectives that I would like to accomplish, I'm off to a false start. So, you know, what I told many, many people is that, you know, the students that we said goodbye to before our spring break are not the same students that we will come back into our Zoom sessions or into our online classroom environments. And I think that was an important realization that, you know, we need to understand the new circumstances in which the students find themselves in. We had students who, you know, had access to only two computers, yet they were working parents at home. They had a second sibling having not access to quiet space. So really thinking about the notion of synchronous versus asynchronous in, in relationship to giving students access. So access and equity uh, are issues I think that we found particularly uh, in, in, in our, you know, through conversations with colleagues at, 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 at different kinds of universities has become a big issue. And I think as we design these environments, as we select those tools, yes, we need to understand how to use those tools. We also need to understand who our students are uh, in order to best serve them, in order to uh, give them a chance for learning uh, and success. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, one more question because we have five minutes left and we wanna make sure that we give, um, give each of you kind of a challenge question here. So we talked about students being isolated. How can faculty support each other? Like this is an amazing conference and it's taking place over two days, but over the long haul over the next couple of months, how do faculty support each other? Um, and what are some tips and recommendations you have for faculty who are trying to, trying to do this and learn from it at the same time? Pick up your phone and call a call a friend, a colleague. You never know where somebody is. I I receive calls or text messages where I was like, you know, not in a good place. And then you have a conversation and you you, you know, you you refocus and you recenter. So I think, you know, just leveraging the community that we have uh, and, and nurturing that in a way, I think to to you know connect with people that we may only see at a conference or or, or randomly throughout the year. I'd say get on a project. I mean, what Elisa's doing with USC and UCLA is a great example. Um, I think project-based learning is gonna supplant a lot of the academic uh, work that a, a lot of us have been doing um, because it's not only is it hard, but it's even more isolating. So when you're, when you're doubly isolated, doing that type of work is difficult, but, but project-based learning can bring a lot of the same insights that you can bring into the classroom. So this is a really good opportunity to find those uh, uh, future uh, those colleagues in, in a project and, and get to it um i i don't know this is exactly answering your question i mean obviously you can use discord or you can use slack we could create a group where people communicate and share ideas but that's entirely a function of whether or not people choose to go in and i do think it springs from colleagues but I would say that there's a future aspect of this. What we're in now is not what we're gonna be in two months from now or six months from now. 
And I think that education as we know it and, and college and academia and learning as we know it is going to be fundamentally mm -hmm. altered by this experience for everybody. So now is the time for us to begin to work together and consider how do we begin to build for our future? Because the post-COVID-19 world, to the extent that there is a post-COVID-19 world, I think it's going to look very, very different. And, and if yesterday wasn't the time to do it or prepare for it, now certainly is. Today is. Excellent. Ernie, yep, go for it. Uh, yeah. Last week, I ran a, a four-hour intensive training program, and I had 35 faculty from around the world who, who wanted to learn the process of working with students, uh, both being the student and how they would work with people who they never met before. So I would put three faculty into a room and they were in charge of a company and they had to do the same kind of a thing their students did. And then I brought in uh, uh, faculty who served as coaches. And so they would come in and visit each team and they would do an executive briefing. And uh, so we went through this cycle three times of the teams working on some aspect of their business. Then a coach comes in and reviews their thinking, uh, the kinds of decisions, analysis, and, and, and where they were going. Step out of the room and let them go and finish up and move on to the next quarter. So this kind of goes back to the Chinese proverb of, if I tell you something, you're going to look, remember, you're going to forget 90% of what I tell you. If you, if I show it to you, like I tried to do, uh, you'll remember. But to fully understand it, you have to do it. And as I look at the examples of the other panel members, I would think that's a great way for us to learn from them. And it doesn't have to be four hours, an hour or something like that, where you can roll up your sleeves and do it so that you're not left ma imagining what that person is suggesting to you. So I would offer that in terms of helping other faculty. Good, great. Well, Elisa, Christoph, Justin, Ernie, thank you so much for your time today. And thank you also to Tam and Sky for helping us on the tech side. Uh, please do make sure to stick around a little bit longer in Whova because some of our uh, attendees may want to ask you some questions uh, either via the app or online here. Uh, thank you all very much and look forward to maybe seeing you at the social later, right? Thanks, everybody. Thank you all. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Tim.